church growth study improving our effectiveness if you got the outline follow along we're going to be showing some uh, statistics here in a minute that you're going to be able to write down some things on your uh, on your sheets and uh, go ahead if you would please open your Bibles to 1st Corinthians chapter 9 we'll be reading that in just a moment 1st Corinthians chapter 9 improving our effectiveness now, as you're turning to 1 Corinthians 9, let me discuss some facts with you, some material that uh, I think is pertinent for us to consider when we're talking about church growth. We need to be very honest with where we are at, not just as a congregation, but where we are at in Churches of Christ in America. And so I want to give you some statistics here. 1990, there were estimated to be 1.8 million adherents. Now, the largest number, by the way, that I've ever seen preceding 1990, it was estimated that there might be two and a half to almost three million. But in 1990, it was 1.8 million. Now, there was some growth over the next couple decades. By 2008, uh, we had seen an increase, not much, but there was an increase, 1.9 million adherents. But just realize, in 2015, in less than seven years from 2008, there was a huge decline in Churches of Christ. In 2015, we had 1.1 million adherents. This is the United States, okay? And we had, to start with, 13,000 congregations. Today, there's 700 less since 1990. Uh, many of you know of congregations who's closed their doors because of attrition or because of division or perhaps other things. But the number of congregations and the number of adherents that we have in the United States and Churches of Christ in America is on the decline, big time. Now that is not true in the world, and there's some reasons for that. There is huge amount of growth in Africa. There's large uh, uh, rates of growth in India. There's other countries where the gospel is being received and it's being responded to. But that's not the case in the United States. And I think that one of the reasons for that is because of denominationalism. And another reason for that, I believe, is because there are just so many things you and I have an opportunity to do besides attend church or besides to pursue a Christian walk. We have more things available today than we had uh, years and years ago. You know this is true. Uh, there's just so much competition for our time and for our attention. And so many people will choose those other things now that weren't afforded to them you know, several, several years ago. So think about that as far as the statistic picture of Churches of Christ, and you might make some notes there, that we have declined. We have obviously declined. Now, I want to talk about a little bit about our heritage, our story, what, what some refer to as the Restoration Movement or some refer to as the Stone-Campbell Movement. Toward the late 1700s, there were people who decided that they had enough of denominationalism, enough of man-made originating religion, uh, people who had written creeds or, or changed names or was purporting uh, human tradition. And so we had a lot of churches 
that wore names of people that they considered the founder of the church, the Wesleyan church or the Lutheran church, named after the founders of those movements. And then there are uh, creeds or catechisms, as we call them, um, books of discipline that that was written out stuff, rules for the church about doctrine, what we believe, what we stand for, what we do. And in the late 1700s, there was a, a movement within our land to get rid of that. We didn't need anything else written down. We had all that we need in the Word of God, the Bible. Do you still believe that's true today, that all we need is the Word of God? Say amen if you believe in the Bible as being all sufficient. Amen? Yeah. And so there were other people that decided from different groups. They were within these different churches who decided enough is enough. We've got to get out of this. What, what Martin Luther had started back in 1517 with nailing the 95 Theses. That's over 500 years ago, by the way. And what he wanted to do in reforming the Catholic Church, that started a wildfire of change. But then in the late 1700s, there was another surge of those who thought we need to get rid of and strip ourselves from all this man-made tradition. We don't need this. We need just simply the Word of God, and we need to be unified, not, not 300 plus different denominations. And so men got together and started discussing these things, started conducting meetings, and, and a lot of them were Presbyterians at the time, a guy by the name of Barton Stone and a guy by the name of Alexander Campbell, whose dad, Thomas Campbell, also was very famous in the Restoration Movement started thinking about ideas of how we rid ourselves of this, go back to the scriptures only. It was Thomas Campbell that said, you may have heard this before, and I quote, we speak where the Bible speaks and we're silent where the Bible is. You probably have heard that before. And it was a simply a, a way of saying, we need to get back to the Bible and restore New Testament Christianity and quit perpetuating traditionalism in the denominations. But to get back, and we want everybody to do it with us. But the only way, the only way we could get to having a unity movement where, and I think you believe this the way I do, wouldn't you wish that all Christians, no matter what churches they went to, no matter, no matter where they're from or where they're at in life, that we all be one instead of all these thousands and thousands of churches? But the only way to do that is to go with a standard that won't change, and that's the Word of God. And I believe that the Word of God is unchanging, but it's very relevant for us today. And so in 1801, there was an event at Cane Ridge. This was in Kentucky. An event that became known as the beginning of the Restoration Movement. Um, we know that uh, Barton W. Stone was a part of this, uh, having been the preacher at the Cane Ridge Church, which was a Presbyterian church at the time. And started purporting these ideas and elsewhere Alexander Campbell and later his dad Thomas were in various other places they didn't know each other but they all kind of found each other because of the, uh, the, the like ideas that they had and at that time those that were starting to leave behind denominationalism started to refer to themselves as simply by the biblical name churches of Christ we read in Romans 16 verse 16 the churches of Christ salute you and then there were other, pla other places in which disciples of Christ, also a very biblical name, began to be the name in use instead of a denominational name. Get rid of the denominational name. Get rid of the denominational creeds. Let's, let's call Bible things with Bible names. We're Christians only. That was the movement. And those two terms, disciples of Christ and churches of Christ, were interchangeable. Now, in 1906, the census had come out and distinguished that within this new movement or this movement that had been around for about 100 years had kind of divided into two distinctive groups. And so then you had a split, a group known as Churches of Christ and a group known as Disciples of Christ. Now, most Disciples of Christ will, on their church sign, read Christian Church, while Churches of Christ just refer to themselves as Churches of Christ. Not a denominational name, by the way. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a phrase of ownership, a possessive wording of the church. Whose church are we? We're Christ. Churches of Christ. Same way with disciples of Christ. So in 1906, there were a couple of issues that had come up that had separated the two groups out. And then in the 1920s, not just one year, but in a course of two or three years, within the disciples of Christ, within the Christian churches, there was another departure that took place. One wanted to remain independent or autonomous as we know it. Uh, in other words, there's no other governing body that tells us what we do. We are independent of any other church 
Our own elders make the decisions. We have the oversight here locally, no regional, no district, no national boards to answer to. And so within the Christian churches, there was one group that wanted to retain what we already understood we had, that independence, and another group that decided there's benefits for the denominational structure. We need the boards, we need the districts, we need the regions, we need the national. And so that group retained the wording, disciples of Christ, and the new group or the group that split off from that to retain the government structure as we maintain today is now known as the independent Christian churches. So we have some designations. I know this is a little technical, but we have COC, that's us, DOC, Disciples of Christ. You can always tell that on their sign, if they have the red uh, chalice with the cross on it, and maybe you've seen that, that d distinguishes them from the independent Christian church while Disciples of Christ and independent Christian church often just go by First Christian Church or Christian Church in their community. And so that just helps us out with knowing that those three uh, affiliated uh, churches in America have the same roots. I just, that's why I want to bring this. It's not really on church history today, but it makes a point in a minute. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about... Uh, a study that comes out every year by Outreach Magazine called Outreach 100, the, the Outreach 100 churches. And every year they take the top growing, not the, not the largest churches in America, but the fastest growing churches in America, and they list them from one to 100. So there's a list of 100 churches. You can go read the report, and you'll, you'll see that there's a, an underlying trend. There's a common denominator that's in this list of 100 churches. Uh, one of the things that you'll note, first of all, is the increasing number every year. This number increases. There are 45 this year that are known as non-denominational. How many of you were raised in the Church of Christ and heard that we are non-denominational? Raise your hand if you knew we were non-denominational. In other words, just meaning we're autonomous. We're not religiously tied to any other governing body. This church, this body of elders decides what's best for this church. All our money stays here unless we choose as a congregation to help with mission work or associate with school efforts or things outside these walls. But this is an autonomous congregation. 45 on that list. And that number is growing and growing and growing. 19 on the list are Baptists, but they had a huge decline. They were in the 30s just a couple years ago. But the Baptist church is becoming less and less popular in the outreach, at least within the fastest growing churches that there are. There were 15 on the list that are independent Christian churches. Now this is the group of churches I just got through saying a moment ago that are a part of our heritage, our roots in, in the Stone Campbell movement, our restoration history. Uh, they're the ones that maintain the same kind of government structure that we maintain still to this day. That we only use the Bible. That we go to the Word of God, we speak where the Bible speaks, we sign it where the Bible is signed. We call Bible things by Bible names, we do Bible th we're, we're We're interested in restoring New Testament Christianity. If I remember right, there wasn't one single Disciples of Christ on the top 100 list. And there wasn't one single Church of Christ on the top 100 list. Now, these churches are growing at a rate of 26%, 38%. Uh, there's an independent Christian church called Elevate Life Church in Jacksonville, Florida that grew by 46% in one year. That's what makes them make this list, is the rate of growth, not, not how large they are. You may be thinking, okay, these are all mega churches. They're not all mega churches. Consider a denomina denominational church in Winter Park, Florida, that started off last year with 489 and at the end of the year, 1,326, that was a growth rate of 58%. We've got growth rates in here as high as 79%. Happens to be a Baptist church called Relevant Church in Locust Grove, Georgia. Started in 2010. They had, at the beginning of last year, 581, and they now have 1,320. That's a growth rate of 79%. I, I am... I, I'm looking for the word here. I am discouraged, first of all, that no churches of Christ are on this list 
being the fastest growing church. You may be thinking, well, that's not that big of a deal. I want you to think about what, what it is we're trying to envision and, 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 and identify in Scripture. The Lord's church was the fastest growing church in the New Testament. Think about it. We're not in the top 100. I didn't go down the list really far, but I think it's safe to say we're not in the top 1,000. If you look at our statistics, we are not growing. 1.1 million, that was in 2015. And remember how much the decline was in such a short period of time of seven years from 1.9 to 1.1 in seven years. Here we are three years away. I don't have active data, but by the time we get to 2020, that'll be five years down the road since the last statistic that I was referring to. Are we still going to be up north of a million? Are we going to lose another 300 congregations to bring us down to 12,000 congregations? Now, in this list of Outreach 100 churches, as I said, 19 are Baptist, 15 are independent Christian churches. Churches of the Stone Campbell Restoration Story Movement are in that group. Fifteen of them are. Uh, I'm looking at the list, numbers 2, 5, 6, 21. Just in the top 25, there are that many independent Christian churches that basically governmentally and doctrinally, apart from worship style, Everything else, theologically speaking, baptizing for the forgiveness of sins, as we still proclaim today, are on this list. Why can't we be on such a list? Okay, one reason might be because we live in Blackwell. I understand this. There's a lot of difference in uh, Florida Park, Florida, or uh, all these other places that we can look and see where they're at in big cities, metropolis areas. The fact is this, though. I can count on one hand... The number of churches of Christ that's relevant to the size of our town and our demographics, I can count on one hand how many churches of Christ are growing. As a matter of fact, I'll just say I know of two that are incomparable sized towns that we are. Obviously, there are more growing churches of Christ, but part of the growth is because of acquisition and mergers consolidation of churches. You read about one just recently in the, in the Christian Chronicle, perhaps, about the story up around the Missouri-Kansas state line in the Kansas City area. If you didn't read that story, it's an awesome story where one eldership was trying to, to get out from underneath dead and trying to do something. They weren't growing, but another church was looking for a place, and they merged. And most of the membership of the old congregation stayed there with a new eldership in mind, with a new eldership in place, and the new vision and the new direction in mind. Still a faithful church of Christ, and you can say, that's an awesome story. That's not really growth. That's two churches getting together to combine to be a, become a bigger church. They will be growing, I believe. But it's not the kind of growth we think that can be possible. But only two churches of Christ that I know of right now that I could actually tell you offhand that are growing. I'd like to be able to say at the end of this vision in 2020 as you see on the banner here we put one here in the auditorium momentum 220 by 2020 that we'll be able to point at ourselves and say we're one that decided that we're going to grow but that's because you made the decision not the elders for you not me for you but you're going to have to have ownership of this vision that's the hope of what i have at the end of this series that we'll buy into this and that we'll understand. Now, there's some other things I want to talk about real quick on Outreach 100 Churches. Here are the characteristics. If you go look at them, there's a little bit of a biography of each one of these congregations. They all had engaging worship services. And yes, as I showed these pictures on a Wednesday night a couple months back, the first thing people saw were lights and sound and stage production and entertainment, entertainment, entertainment. And it is true that you saw instruments or you saw other things like that that you might say, those are gimmicks. Why are people going there? Are they going for the right reason? By the way, it is not our place to judge why anybody goes to anywhere unless you've talked with them first. Isn't that right? And there is nothing in Scripture 
that says entertainment in and of itself is sinful. I think sometimes we, we paint everything with a broad brush. They're there for the wrong reason. They got the stage, the lights, the smoke. Well, we had that one of the nights at VBS. Remember the volcano on stage? We had lights and stage and smoke and, and sound. But let me be very clear. It's not the intention of this eldership, not the intention of this ministry staff to introduce anything theologically questionable within our worship services. There is not an effort to include mechanical instruments in our praise time of our worship together in the assembly. And I don't think that's necessary for us to grow. I believe that's just a statement we're making here to, to show you that while we call for change, you need to understand we're not talking about changing the message. We're talking about changing the method. It's the methodology. I do believe that we can grow as a church, and that's why I'm pointing this out. But every one of these Outreach 100 churches, I believe, have something to offer for us to see because they're doing things that do require change. They're connecting to the community. They're doing service projects around town. They're getting a name for themselves because of what they're willing to do for others, and they're reaching out. They're distancing themselves from tradition. The reason why the number of non-denominational churches on this list is growing is because they're leaving behind old traditional names. There's a church in Ponca City. It used to be the Grand Avenue Church. Y'all know where that is. It's now Methodist Church has, has come over there and they have started, they left behind their old Methodist Church name and they've created a church there that will now be growing and they feel that they're growing because they're distancing themselves from the traditional model of church growth. Now last week, if you'll remember, I said that we need to distance ourselves from maybe the traditional model of church growth from just being a come mentality type of growth to being a go mentality kind of growth. Y'all remember that, right? And I mentioned last week that that is going to require that you and I will do the uncomfortable and the inconvenient thing. I want to continue that a little bit more but first, let me mention one more thing about the Outreach 100 churches. There tends to be an emphasis on conservative biblical doctrine. On conservative biblical doctrine. They're biblically centered messages. Now, let's look at our text as we continue in our little study here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And I'm going to put the words on the screen. I encourage you to go along in the Bible, but... I, I really don't want anybody to miss what is in these few verses because I think the Apostle Paul has a secret for us that will be the key in understanding how we can grow. He starts off by saying, Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. Now let's just look at that verse first and let's break that down. He says... I know where I stand, and I don't owe anybody anything. I know I don't have to become like somebody else. I can just be me. And what that would include is I can have my opinions, I can keep my preferences, I can stay in my comfort zone, and nobody can force me out of that. But I am willing to relinquish that. Even the terminology he uses, I will make myself a slave. In other words, giving up some of the rights that I feel is rightfully mine. I'm willing to give up rights to become this slave. And there's an end result here. And the end result would be this. This is his intention. To win as many as possible. To win as many as possible. Go on to the next verse. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Now, he is a Jew, by the way. He's a unique Jew. He's also a Roman citizen, which puts him in, in a, a great company of a lot of Gentiles as well. But he is a Jew. But he, what he's saying is, I'm approaching Jews. Now, when, he, when I say he's a Jew, he is one culturally. But having become a Christian, he is no longer under Jewish law. But to connect to the ones that are still being Jews and practicing Judaism, 
he is going to approach from the viewpoint of being like one under the law, and the end result is so that I can win those that are under the law. Next verse. To those not having the law, and that would be Gentiles, of course, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law. But when we're referring to the law here, usually you're talking about the old sacrificial system law, the the law of Moses, but we still have a Christian law today. And that's what he's saying. To the Gentiles, I become like one who wasn't raised a Jew like I was. By the way, isn't it interesting when God selected Paul to be a specially chosen apostle, that the words to Ananias were that day when he was saying, Ananias, I'm sending a guy to you, or I want you to go over to see this guy. His name's Saul, that's his Jewish name. And Ananias kind of says, wait, 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 don't you know that he persecutes Christians? And God's answer was, I've chosen him to be a special instrument, an instrument of mine to the Gentiles. Paul is referred to as the apostle to the Gentiles. And he says this, I am willing to become like a Gentile so that I can reach who? Gentiles, right? So as to win those not having the law. He says in verse 22, to the weak, I became what? Weak. To do what? To win the weak. And then he makes this statement. I have become all things to all men so that by all means I might save some. I'm going to read that again. I have become all, help me, to all, so that by all, another word for means is method. Nowhere here does Paul say, I'm changing the message so it would be more popular. That stuff about the death, burial, and resurrection on the cross and getting baptized and all that stuff is is too hard for people. I'm going to water that down some. I'm going to lessen that so I'll get more people attracted. That's not what he's saying. But the approach I'm taking, the method, the style, I'm willing to change that. That was Paul's biggest plan in becoming all things to all men so that by all means I might save. And he doesn't say that I save them all. I want to do all this for all of them by all possible means so that I can need everybody. That's not what he's saying. Even if I just win some... I'm willing to do that. I ask you a question this morning after reading this together. Is it Paul's intent to protect his own preferences? Or is he willing to extend an effort to connect with others and their preferences? I think Paul has given the answer, don't you? Okay, how does that break down to maybe what that means with us? It may not be the most productive thing from an evangelistic standpoint to always be singing just all the old hymns anymore that don't resonate or connect with today's generation. Now I know I might be stepping on toes, but I for one will admit I love the hymns, but I understand the reality that the the average copyright date of our hymnal songs are older than everybody here, aren't they? They are. And it might mean that we have to learn a new song. Oh, man, heaven forbid that we learn a new song. Uh, Speaking of heaven, (laughs) have you read Revelation lately that says when you get there? What what song number are we singing when we get there? David, do you know what song number are we singing when we get to heaven? It's not 728B. There's no B's in heaven. Jordan, do you know what number out of the hymnal is the song we're singing in heaven, does anybody know? A new song? If you don't like it here, well, you finish it. <laughs> Paul says, I'm willing to give up that stuff that I prefer. This is my favorite. This is my favorite song. This is my favorite translation. This is my favorite color of the pews. This is my favorite this. This is my favorite that. This is my favorite way. This is my comfort zone. And Paul says, I'm setting that aside. I am willing to change if it means I could save others. And his motivating factor in every one of those, just about every verse we showed you, 
on the side so that I can save people. To win as many as possible, even though it may just be some. And then he says in this last verse of our text, verse 23, I do all this for the sake of Paul, for the sake of David or Jordan or Lanny or Arlen. Do any of us have the guts to say that the reason we're here today is for the sake of me or you? Who's here today that's here for the sake of God? And who's here today for the sake of not only God, but in the hopes of there'll be more people like me that'll give it to God? Amen. And he says, if we don't, I realize what Paul is saying here is, if I wasn't willing to become the Jew, if I'm not willing to become weak to save the weak, if I'm not willing, guess what? If I'm not willing to do all those things, I'm not going to get my goal done. The only reason he says I'm willing to do that is because I can save some. But as it is now, retaining on of my personal preferences will save no one, possibly not even myself. That's the truth. And I'll miss out on sharing in its blessings. And if we have people that will not be like Paul, you will miss out on the blessings. If we decide right here and now, that's all good and fine, Lanny. That's a great, great concept. But we, we like it the way it is. I'm telling you, we're missing out on the blessings that we can count two years down the road or until Jesus comes. And I don't want to miss out. Do you? I want to share in the gospel's blessings. We need to be willing to win. I mean, I like to win, don't you? And, and, and I know you're thinking maybe from the very outset that sounds like competitiveness. But as I have been sharing on Wednesday nights in our Wednesday night group study on church growth, I'll share this with you. We are in competition for souls. God wants to win souls. And there are churches, and I believe the Outreach 100 churches is an example of churches who have decided we're willing to go and get as many as possible. And there's not a church of Christ on that list. And there ought to be. I'd be happy if we can grow by single digit percentages. At least that'd be growth. I'd be happy, wouldn't you, to know that maybe by the year 2020 when the census is taken, they'll look at the demographics within Churches of Christ and we're closer to two million than we are one million, don't you? And it will be because we were willing to do anything it took to win souls. Jesus himself said, I've came to seek and save the lost. Are you following him? Seeking and saving the lost. But here's what it's going to take. Number two, we need to be willing to bend. We do. We need to be willing to, like Paul, set aside our own preferences for the sake that we could get more people here. The gospel will remain the same. Jesus still died on the cross. He was buried in the tomb and he was raised on the third day. And we will still do the things Bible ways. We're not approaching denominationalism when we say this is our goal. We are saying we want to maintain undenominational Christianity. We are still for bringing all people together in a unified way under the name of Christ only. Let's be Christians only. But I do have to be willing to bend things I might not be comfortable with. In his book, Dying for Change, Leith Anderson says, and I quote, Change is extremely difficult, but absolutely necessary. His point in the book is, churches that are not willing to change will die. We must be like, it's biblical. I've just shown you a verse from an apostle who says, I'm willing to change. Are we? We need to be willing to win, to bend, and we need to be willing to send. 
Maybe there's some things that we cannot do personally ourselves, but we can help support and we can help send people that are willing to go out and meet that loss. Because if we're going to do everything possible to win as many as possible, then you'll pull out all the stops like Paul did. What are you willing to do to grow this church? What are you willing to do in an effort to change or to improve your view of, I want to win everybody around me? What are you willing to give up to bend so that you can win everybody around you? And what will you do to send? So we're going to sing this song, and if you have a need to respond to the invitation, if there's something on your heart, if there's something maybe God's calling you to do now, to make a change, to make a challenge statement to yourself, but you just need the encouragement of this church, we're going to stand and sing this song. If you come up to the front, we'll take care of that. We'll pray about that. Let's capture.